The SLS Lunar Rocket is now at risk of getting canceled at any moment. As a result, many are looking for alternatives to this expensive and repeatedly delayed rocket. Naturally, Starship's the first name that comes to mind. However, while Starship's still in a testing phase and not yet ready for immediate mission deployment, is there another way for the U.S. to get back to the moon? Well, an excellent proposal has long captured the attention of the space community, and that's resurfacing, which is SpaceX's Crew Dragon. So, how would Crew Dragon land on the moon? Why is it NASA utilizing this vehicle to expedite a lunar mission? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. At the forefront of NASA's current lunar mission strategy is the combined deployment of the Orion spacecraft and SLS envisioned as the backbone for getting astronauts to the moon. However, the execution of this plan has encountered significant obstacles. Recently, Boeing, the primary contractor for SLS, alerted 800 employees involved in its development about the possible layoff of up to 400 staff members due to the SLS program's possible cancellation by the government. This highlights the dire state of the program, to the point where Boeing has resorted to last-ditch efforts, lobbying officials and organizations to rally support in a bid to save this moon rocket. To be frank, while NASA has yet to make an official announcement, the cancellation of SLS seems to be just a matter of time. In reality, SLS has been mired in years of developmental delays and budget overruns. The rocket's first launch was initially planned in 2016, but got delayed six years before finally taking flight, and has only launched once. This indicates that technical issues with the rocket hardware can be quite time-consuming. Of course, along with it comes the loss of finances. From its inception in 2011 through the year of its first flight, the Space Launch System rocket program has cost almost $24 billion. Orion's Deep Space Capsule cost $20.5 billion since the program started back in 2006. Related ground infrastructure upgrades cost an additional $5.7 billion since 2012. In total, NASA has spent $49 billion on these programs between 2006 and the first test in 2022, exceeding the initial estimates by more than 42.5%. Considering these achievements, we don't have much confidence in the capability of SLS and Orion to carry out a crewed lunar orbit mission by 2026, let alone a moon landing by 2027. It may significantly lag behind NASA's recently established schedule. Now a viable alternative has emerged. The contract leading to the development of the Dragon crewed spacecraft was initiated by NASA in 2014. In the span of six years, and with an investment of $3 billion, SpaceX successfully launched astronauts into orbit. The significance of this achievement extends beyond space exploration, showcasing that a well-led entrepreneurial team can achieve feats that were once deemed possible only for superpowers. What SpaceX demonstrated, particularly with the reusable Falcon vehicles, goes beyond efficiency, challenging notions of what's impossible. This marks nothing short of a revolution in the approach to space exploration, introducing a paradigm shift in both time and cost considerations. We acknowledge the dedicated efforts of NASA and its contractors in the development of the Orion SLS system, but it's evident that these endeavors have been surpassed by the agility of more nimble commercial companies. Dragon spacecraft, crafted by SpaceX, not only boasts a lower cost than Orion, but outperforms it due to its substantially lighter mass with Dragon weighing at 9.5 tons compared to Orion's 26 plus tons. One reason Orion's gotten so large and expensive is that its destinations and requirements keep on changing. The vehicle has, at various times, been intended for use as a space station taxi, a spacecraft to fly astronauts to distant asteroids, and before its current role as a means of getting astronauts to and from a high lunar orbit. This has necessitated costly design changes. NASA also placed some stringent requirements on Orion that have been borne by no previous spacecraft. For example, in case of a depressurization event, there is a requirement that Orion keep its crew members alive for seven days in their space suits. This adds mass and complexity to a system for what seems like a rare circumstance. Furthermore, SLS faces a critical limitation. It cannot deliver Orion to low lunar orbit with sufficient propellant for a return journey, a capability 
critical for lunar missions akin to the Apollo program. In response, NASA proposes construction of a new space station in high lunar orbit dubbed the Gateway to serve as a waypoint for Orion. However, this plan introduces a convoluted set of challenges. Traveling from the moon to the high Gateway orbit and back necessitates a lander with double the propellant required for a journey from low Earth orbit. Described as a Rube Goldbergian plan, this approach not only incurs substantial costs, but also introduces delays to the Artemis program schedule undermining its efficiency. But is Crew Dragon really capable of replacing Orion? Despite weighing only 20% more than an Apollo capsule, it boasts 50% increase in internal space, running it more than adequately spacious for its purposes. What's advantageous is the ability to circumvent the waiting time and costs associated with SLS. The already operational Falcon Heavy launcher from SpaceX is fully capable of transporting Crew Dragon to low lunar orbit, complete with a fully fueled return stage, rendering the gateway station unnecessary. While the landing process would still involve a two-rocket scenario, one for delivering Crew Dragon to lunar orbit and another for the lander, it proves significantly more cost-effective. This approach would require two Falcon Heavies in contrast to two SLS boosters, each of which incurs tenfold higher costs. Instead of spending over $3.5 billion a year on the development costs for Orion and SLS, NASA could just buy several Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon Heavy rockets to launch them. The cost disparities between NASA's existing programs and commercially driven alternatives are remarkable. A comprehensive analysis by the Planetary Society reveals that NASA has committed a staggering $23.7 billion to the development of the Orion spacecraft intended for deep space missions, hosting up to four astronauts for a duration of 21 days. In sharp contrast, the commercial crew program's investment in Crew Dragon amounted to a mere $1.7 billion, a fraction of the cost, with the added benefit of the Crew Dragon having successfully proven its capabilities. Furthermore, NASA's expenditure on the SLS always reaches an enormous figure. It's got to bear costs of at least $4 billion per launch once it becomes operational. In stark contrast, SpaceX independently financed the entire development of the Falcon Heavy launcher. A lunar launch using SpaceX's Falcon Heavy is estimated to cost NASA around $200 million, representing a remarkably cost-effective alternative compared to the investments associated with the government-funded SLS. This underscores the economic efficiency and financial prudence demonstrated by commercial entities in the realm of space exploration. So, why doesn't NASA use Crew Dragon to get to the moon sooner? The first reason is that they can't easily abandon a project that has so much funding. Honestly, SLS program's goals aren't inherently aligned with space exploration, lunar landing, heavy lift, or other aspects of space travel. Instead, they seem to function as a mechanism primarily focused on channeling funding into various congressional districts. This program appears designed to incentivize delays in cost overruns, its exclusion could mean the financial inflow comes to an end. On the other hand, according to a former NASA administrator back in 2020, the proposal to use Dragon instead of Orion for the moon program was completely rejected. I think it's important to note that Crew Dragon was specifically designed for low Earth orbit and to send it to the moon would require a ton of modifications, he said. I'm not saying you couldn't modify it, but if you modified it, it would just look a lot like Orion. But that seems to be just an excuse for them to keep the costly SLS and Orion program. Garrett Reisman, a former astronaut and consultant, noted that traveling beyond LEO would therefore require some substantial but feasible changes to the spacecraft. Dragon's comm system works through GPS, so it would need a new communications and navigation system. In terms of radiation, he said, addressing this for astronauts is relatively straightforward, but hardening electronics would require some work. The heat shield could be made capable of returning to the moon for relatively easy, Reisman said. Additional consumables for a longer journey would take up interior volume. It does not include various safety factors that would increase the reliability, but NASA could solve that by launching Dragon separately on Falcon 9 and another propulsion module on another Falcon 9. They could then dock a procedure NASA perfected during the Gemini bays and then proceed to the moon.
This would certainly be an interesting approach if it were to be implemented again in the future. However, the specifics remain uncertain, and we'll have to wait and see what changes unfold in the SLS, Orion, and Lunar Gateway programs down the road. To wrap up this news segment, let's turn our attention now to the latest impressive launch from Rocket Lab, often dubbed the second SpaceX. Rocket Lab launched the fourth set of satellites for French company Canet on February 8th as it extends its lead in the small launch sector. Rocket Lab Electron lifted off from the company's launch Complex 1, the vehicle's kick stage, deployed its payload of five satellites a little more than an hour after liftoff in orbits with planned at altitudes of 646 kilometers and inclinations of 97 degrees. The launch was the fourth of five rocket labs it's performing for Canis, a French company developing in Constellation for Internet of Things services after launches in June, September, and November last year. These companies assigned a contract for five electron launches in 2021 to deploy the full Canis constellation. Canis execs said last fall they expected to have the full constellation in service by the middle of this year. At the time, the company said that initial services, including the Internet of Things communication and automatic identification tracking, could start early this year using the first 10 sats, but has not given any updates since then. The company announced December 23rd that its founding chief executive, Alexander Tisseron, has stepped down but didn't disclose a reason for departure. Christophe Assal, a chair of the company's supervisory board, is leading Canet's temporarily with plans to hire a new CEO in the first quarter. I'm proud to leave Canet's after many exciting years filled with collective success and ambitious projects, Tisseron said in a statement. I'm confident that the company is now solidly positioned to continue growth and development. The launch is the first of this year for Rocket Lab, which has conducted 16 launches in 2024, including the two of the haste suborbital variants of the rocket. The company has not disclosed a specific target for this year, but states it projects exceeding that mark. That activity has made Rocket Lab the leading player in the small launch market as many of its competitors have struggled technically or financially. Pete Beck, founder and CEO, took a victory lap in a keynote presentation at the SmallSat Symposium early this month. Our view is that small launch is well and truly being solved, he said in the talk delivered by video. Electron has been very successful there. He argued that Electron had found a niche for customers seeking dedicated launches of small sets and willing to pay a premium compared to rideshare alternatives like SpaceX's transporter and bandwagon missions. Most people thought that would be the end of small launch, he said of those rideshare options, but in fact, it wasn't at all. Small launches have continued to grow and grow, and every year we sign more and more deals and do more and more launches. That includes a contract Rocket Lab announced February 4th with the Japanese Institute for Kyushu Pioneers of Space, or IQPS, for four electron launches of radar imaging satellites. Three of those launches are scheduled this year and the fourth next, each carrying a single IQPS satellite. Back in the statement about the contract, stated that Electron is well suited for deploying constellations as those systems require spacecraft being deployed to precise orbits on tailored timelines to maximize data collection or service provision of the overall constellation. This is the unique and reliable service that dedicated launch on Electron delivers. And that's it for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.